Betsy Kaufman, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it is a pleasure to be with you today. I'm super excited to have a conversation around creating and transforming the next generation of organizations. Uh, we're in the middle of tectonic <laughs> shifts happening in the world of work and disruptive innovations left and right and, and rise of the gig economy and layer on top of all of that. We have uh, you know this COVID pandemic that everyone's been dealing with the last couple of years. And the reality is that the successful organizations of tomorrow might look a little different than the successful organizations of a generation ago or even of today. So we're yeah. going to unpack that, explore that together as we go throughout our conversation today. As we get started, I wanted to share Betsy's bio with everybody. For the past 20 years, Betsy Kaufman has worked side by side with hundreds of leaders and has seen just about every variation of how leadership teams operate and execute, both successfully and not so successfully. She started her own coaching and consulting firm, Cross Impact Coaching. Her superpowers include the ability to see, name, and discuss the elephants in the room while empathetically delivering honest and open feedback. And that is a tremendous superpower. We need more of that in the <laughs> world. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background before we launch on in? No, I think that's that's a lot, right? Right then and there. I think, you know, that's maybe how the TED Talk, uh, I'm also a TED speaker, and that's how the TED Talk uh, came to fruition was how do we have honest conversations at work? So I'm sure we'll unpack that a little bit uh, more into the podcast. So, but thank you for having me, John. I'm super excited to talk about so many amazing topics when it comes around next gen organizations and how to transform. And we are really in, as you said, like a major shift in, in corporate um, culture and how we work and how we operate and gosh, change has been just like thrown at us like two folds for the past. Now we're at two years, I think almost a two year, two year mark coming up here in March as to this great pandemic and work from home style. So yeah, let's go. We've got so many good things to talk about here. <laughs> Wonderful. And so maybe let's just start that. We've referred to it a, a couple of times, obviously the pandemic, yes. um, rise of the gig economy, distributed workforce, disruptive technologies and innovations influencing the type of work that we do, you know, AI, machine learning, advanced robotics, like all these different things, right? So when you think about the next generation of work, like what is in your mind as like some of, of those characteristics of the future successful, yeah. uh, really robust organization? Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of it comes down to, there's a couple of things here. I think, you know, you're going to start to see organizations and their cultures changing, right? So that's, that's kind of the core thing when you start with it. So as an organization, how do you approach your people? How do you approach where people work and where people live? And, you know, there's, there's a lot that's going on with this whole, um, uh, the great resignation. And it's funny because I was thinking it's about more of the great reevaluation, and not only are we seeing individuals reevaluating how they, where they want to work, how they want to live, what's their balance, but now organizations need to reevaluate, okay, who are we and who do we want to be in the future? So I think we're in this tremendous, great reevaluation. And, um, you know, obviously technology has played a huge part, whether they were ready or not for it come March of 2020, they got thrust into it really quickly. And they, you know, I think that was very telling as to how quickly could we shift from being a potentially, you know, 100% on site or maybe a hybrid workforce to 100% virtual. How do we make sure that our folks are enabled? Do our products and our services lend to it? Do, do our customers actually still want our products? Are they relevant? You know, the big box retailers, I don't know, you know if you don't have a great, awesome distribution system and a, a top-notch online um, shopping experience, I mean, you better, you better get there because that's where people are at this point in time. And so the technology alone is, is just fascinating to watch how these companies are having to really pivot and shift and make it a priority. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, of um, articles about there like, are you a tech company or are you like an insurance company or a healthcare company? And so I think, you know, good leaders and great organizations are really understanding the power of technology and how to start to harness that. Um, and how do we upscale our, our workforce to be able to support that as well? So lots yeah. of different topics here, lots of different things going on, but it's absolutely a critical time for organizations to be able to succeed and to thrive in the next five to 10 years to really reevaluate all those aspects, the people part of it, the technology part of it, the culture part of it, um, lots, lots of things happening in those spaces. 
Yeah, yeah. Every nowadays, every organization needs to be a tech organization, right? That yes. uses technology to advance its, you know, its position in the market and and provide its products and services. Uh, regardless of what you do, you got to be connected. And every employee needs to be technologically literate and savvy enough to be able to to work within that space. And so it doesn't matter, you know, what kind of work you do. It doesn't right. really matter, you know labor intensive blue collar white collar work knowledge economy work whatever like whatever we're talking about uh we need to really up our game in terms of of technology literacy and quantitative literacy and and analytics and data and all those sorts of things um something else you said that i think is just super super important as we think about this the shift in the nature of work um is going to be largely determined by the type of culture that your organization has. Absolutely. And I also think like, what kind of company are we get back to basics? What are your core values? What yes. are you, what's your purpose? What are you trying to accomplish? Um, you know, like Starbucks, they're, they're a coffee company, right? They, they, yeah. people go and get coffee, but are they really a coffee business? No, they're a, they're in the business of making people's day better. And they create an experience around that. And so coffee is one mechanism and they have other products and drinks and, and whatnot, or you can get really tasty, you know, other treats, but it's also just like a place you can go with your laptop and get some work done with some nice ambiance. Right. So, so that's just one silly example, but there are so many examples when you really know what your purpose is the, the product or service you provide is just kind of the means to, to get to that purpose. It's not the purpose in and of itself. And I think that's something that, that companies often get backwards and really kind of forget. And so you layer that on top, like this, this value, getting back to values and purpose, um, layering on the fact that every organization needs to be a tech organization in this day and age. And then we get to what is the culture of our organization? What is it currently? Right. Do we have a healthy, dynamic, psychologically safe culture where yeah. we, where it's inclusive and truly we like attract a diverse workforce because everyone feels like they're needed, wanted, valued, and that they have a chance to contribute in meaningful ways that they truly belong. That's, that's a cultural element it is. that it's some, huge. some organizations yeah. have grown into and, and many, probably most organizations are still trying to wrestle with how to do. Right. right. And right. as I think into the future and I think about fu successful future organizations, they're going to have to get the technology right. They're going to have to have their purpose right. They're going to have to have inclusivity and uh, other cultural elements. Right. Yeah. And without those as a foundation, you know, I'm not so sure they're going to be able to survive. Yeah, I think there's there's a couple different things here to, to look at. So one is, you know, do you actually live your values, right? So if you go to any company, majority of them have a mission statement. They have, you know, who they are, what's their purpose, what's their vision, what's their values, but really it's taking a step back to say, are we actually living into these? And do we believe these or are they just really nice websites speak? Are they really just pretty fluffy words to make us feel good? And I think that's probably the, the, the first step of it is to say, okay, who are we, like you said, as a company, who do we want to be? And are we actually uh, living into that from a cultural perspective? Um, I had a conversation with a company, it was probably about a year ago. And they were like, and I went to their site, I'm like, oh, these are great. And they're like, yeah, we just, this is from the marketing department. I can't actually say that we do this. And so one of the tips and tricks that I, I learned from um, a company that I was working with was starting every meeting to say, or not maybe every meeting, but like your key meetings. So how did you actually, which value of our core company values did you live this, this month, this week? What have you been able to exhibit? And so really trying to lead with who do you, who are you and how do you live into our values and how do we as a company live into it? And I thought when I went through that exercise, I thought it was really fantastic because it made you think right? Like, oh, which one of these values did I actually bring to the surface? And am I truly living the values? Am I not? I think the other side of it is consumers are getting to have more of a choice, right? So as consumers, we're getting very, very picky. And there will be times when you just won't shop a store or a brand because you don't believe in where they're going, either politically or, you know, with their products. And so I also think that's another piece of the pie of this puzzle of, of where we're going in this, you know, the future of the company says, so who are our consumers? And are we actually speaking to the right consumers? Do people, you know, like who our values are and what we offer? So I think there's some, I mean, it's, it's really is almost a 360 when an organization is thinking about, okay, who are we? We got to think about our people, 
internally, we got to think about our consumers. Externally, we got to think about ourselves as leaders. You know, and how do we take that 360 and make sure that we are really sure and centered and grounded in who we are and where we want to go um, from an organization perspective? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that that kind of a reevaluation is super important. We've all been there. We've all been in organizations that espouse their certain values yeah. uh, and a certain vision and mission, and they don't live up to it. And <clears throat> on the one hand, it's it's good to have espoused values and perhaps ones that even stretch us and, and are a little right. bit out of our reach because it gives us yeah. something to work towards. But on the other hand, if, if you're just giving lip service to really important things, your people are going to know, like your people in the company, your employees are going to know, your consumers are going to know, yeah. you're not, you're not fooling anybody. And then instead of actually helping your cause, it just comes across as obfuscation and gaslighting. And, right. and you just lose the trust in the loyalty yeah. of your people, whether again, whether that's internal, external, uh, whatever the constituency, whatever the stakeholder group, you're going to lose them because right. they're not going to believe that you're working towards it. Nobody expects you to be perfect. Nobody, yeah, exactly. you know, everyone right. knows it's a messy world and, and it's complex and it's hard and it's difficult to navigate all these tricky things and everyone gets that. So you yeah. don't need to be perfect. You just need to own up to, you know, the mistakes that you make, try yes. to make them right, and then just be honest, genuine, and sincere, you know, and if, exactly. if you can, if you can do that, then I think you're going to resonate with people. And, and from the consumer standpoint, absolutely. Consumers more and more, they want, they are driven by kind of a social impact mentality. So yeah. Yeah. what what is the organization doing that's benefiting the world in some way? And it's not just about buying coffee or making a widget or whatever, right? It's, it's yeah. about something bigger. And the same thing applies to employees. More and more, especially younger employees, but really everyone, I mean, more and more everyone wants to work for a place that is meaningful, where you have purpose-driven work, where it's fulfilling, and where you actually see yourself making a contribution okay. to the world, um, okay. you're, you're, act, you're, you're actually making an impact. Everyone wants that. And organizations in the past could kind of get away with, you know, maybe saying the right things, but not really following up with them. Um, but nowadays, especially amidst the really tight labor market, you can't get away with that. And right. as we move into the future, you know, will the labor market always be as tight as, as it is right now? I don't know. We can only guess. But what we know is the trajectory has been for a long time, increasingly dispersed, distributed workforce, increasing uh, gig work and contingent workforce, more and more on both sides, really, the employers wanting more flexibility in the people they hire and the talent they rent, but also uh, employees or the people with the skills more often than not wanting more autonomy, flexibility, and they're willing to forego maybe a traditional organizational career experience for, you know, putting up their own shingle, doing their own thing. And, and so I think, you know, it, I was, yeah, I was we, we, may, like we may not be as tight of a labor, labor market as we are right now, say in a couple of years, but I, th I think this is kind of a new kind of situation that we need to get used to. I think it's going to continue to be, it is going to be a tight labor market because people are becoming more aware, right? I don't have to join a company and stay there for 20 years. And I mean, that's even, you know, probably five years ago, that was even the case. You know, I mean, we saw a huge shift of people job jumping, but now to your point, and I literally was just talking to my team about this um, just before this call, just before this podcast um, was you're going to really start to see a shift in contractors and contract labor force, right? I want to pick as an employee, who I work with, what work do I do? When do I work? Where can I work from? And so if companies, like if you, I remember I worked for a leader, it was probably about five years ago at like a very, very large you know, financial five, top five firm. And he said, one of my goals is when you walk into my team room, I don't want you to know whether there's a contractor or an employee. And he really had, I mean, he was very forward thinking because he, he valued the people. Right. He didn't really care. OK, are you an FTE and your paycheck has the name of the institution or are you getting it from, you know, a contractor? You have your own company. It was more about I want everybody to believe in what we do and to want to be a part of that. And that was probably one of the best um, opportunities that I ever had. I loved that team. I love that leader. We that team stuck together for years. 
I mean, just because they believed in what they were working on and it wasn't, oh, well, you're a contractor, we can't send you to training. So, or you don't get to be in this meeting because it's only for the FTEs. So that's some of the shift that I think we are gonna continue to see and it's gonna get even more so increasing because folks want freedom. They want independence, like you said, they want autonomy, they wanna make decisions. And so companies need to start thinking about, okay, how do we allow that? How do we make sure that we keep these really awesome people regardless if they're contractors or FTEs and really make sure that we're providing them good, meaningful work so they stay sticky. Because the worst thing that will happen is whether it's a contractor or employee, they've got all that knowledge and they can walk out the door, right? Tomorrow. Yeah. And, and they have they, options, right? They like do the, the, lots. The, ge- yeah. the geographical boundaries, uh, the geographical you know limitations on the ability to do work have vanished. And yes. so your people, not only could they get poached by another organization down the street, they could get, could get poached you know, by an organization in China or Bangladesh or France or wherever, right? And it literally could happen overnight. So you have to be, a, you have to be mindful of the employee experience. And when I say employee, I, I guess I mean the people experience, like people. Uh, mm-hmm. really anyone who's working as a part of your team in some capacity, you have to be mindful of that. And you have to make sure, I liked how you said it, you have to make it sticky. You have to make sure that they really are invested and they, they feel valued. And if not, you know, they have options. Everyone has options nowadays. And, and that's just the way it is. So when I think of the future organization, I absolutely think of that. And it's so, it's so funny because the pandemic shifted us that way, like on a dime and very, very dramatically. And it's so funny to, to watch the organizations that resisted it early on and continue even almost two years later to resist Mm -hmm. (laughs) these changes. And I get it. I get that change is scary. And I understand that people are comfortable with what they're used to and, and what they know. Um, But when when I see an organization two years into this, still trying to like rein people in and micromanage their people and monitor everything and like take away any sort of flexibility and have a compliance based culture rather than, you know, more of a, an autonomy driven, you know, uh, empowerment culture. When I see that, I'm just like, you are not going to last very long. Exactly. You're going to lose all your good people. And, and you can see it in real time. You it's can happening. see yeah, it's, it's happening. Happen- yep. Yeah. I spent, I work with a company that is like that currently. And so the leaders are asking me like, what can we do? And I'm like, well, let's look at your policies. Do they have to come into work? I mean, for the past two years, they've been working from home. So they, and they've been very successful and you've been able to deliver your projects and meet your numbers and, and have all your goals be met. So where can you, those are, those are self-imposed rules that these organizations put in place. Right. And so there comes a point where you've got to step back and say, okay, what are our hardcore rules that we think we can't move on? Are they really that hardcore? Or can we actually start to become flexible and start to be, you know, a little bit more malleable in what we're expecting of these folks? Um, I and, know they're, I and, have- and they're almost never actually set in stone, hard, fast rules. Almost We've never. We've like this for 20 <laughs> years or 40 years or 50 years. There's no way that we can actually change. I'm like, well, why? Because I mean, we are getting pushed anyway. And, you know, let's send people to amazing trainings and virtual trainings and allow them to have time to actually up, upskill themselves. No, we don't have the budget for it. Well, guess what? They actually probably have the budget personally. So if you're not going to pay for it, they'll eventually pay for it themselves and they're going to leave the company. So it's, it's all about that shifting, that thinking as to, okay, how do we get creative and really um, making sure that the people that work for us love their work? And, and that's part of what we do as a company. That's one of, I mean, that is basically our underlying mission is, is to help companies create workplaces where people wake up every morning and they're motivated. Like you've been there when you go work for a company and you wake up and you are so excited to get into that call or be a part of that conversation. I mean, there's something there as opposed to like, oh gosh, it's Monday morning. Here we go. Another call, seven hours, 12 hours of meetings, back to back all day, right? That's not motivating. And then, you know, the other side of it is, do you end your day feeling fulfilled? So when you're at the very end of every single day, do you like, I had a great day. I worked really hard. I met with some great people. We collaborated, we produced great product or whatever it is that you do for a living. Do you end your day feeling fulfilled and have you created that life that you're motivated and you're fulfilled? And if you have a company that's not trying to achieve that for their employees, then I think that's where they're missing the mark. 
And that's where they need to take a step back. So that's that's where we started. That's what the company's called Cross Impact. And that's, you know, my core at the very heart of it is to create great workplaces because I worked for some really amazing people and I worked with some amazing people and I've worked for some really terrible companies. And <laughs> you know, as you said, they're not going to stay in business long or they're going to, you know, as, as people start to get more awake as to, wait, I don't have to put up with this. I can actually do exactly what I do, probably make more money and have fun at it um, somewhere else. Okay. So the only thing that's holding them back is maybe some fear, but you know, a little bit of, they see maybe their peers doing it. All of a sudden you're going to start to see that shift happening and where people um, go to work and how they want to spend their days. So it's exciting. I love it. I'm so excited about it at this point. It it is. (laughs) It is exciting. And I, and I get that change is scary. Um, but I think overall, you know, it's, it's just super exciting uh, to, to see the, the shift in the trajectory. And the way I see it is that we're moving in a, you know, sometimes it's two steps forward, one t- step back. But overall, I feel like we're moving in a positive direction to have more healthy, positive, empowering workplaces where people are doing more interesting, uh, fulfilling work. And so even when we talk about AI and machine learning, are, is, is that technology going to displace some types of tasks and some, even some jobs? Sure. But what it's going to do is it's going to take away all the monotonous rote types of work that nobody likes doing anyways. And then it's going to free up your time so you can focus on things that actually matter. That's interesting. And so I, th- I see that as a net positive as long as people are willing to reskill and upskill. Um, now, I'm interested in your thoughts on this transformation, because let's say you are a leader in an organization that's kind of old school. They're really resisting the change. uh, And, you know, people just continually pointing to, well, we have a policy that says we have to do it this way. I'm like, okay, but policies aren't set in stone. You can change them. So like, what's, what, what would you say to leaders who find themselves in that kind of an organization to help them start the transformation process so that they're not caught flat-footed, so they actually can adapt and be ready for the next generation of the world of work. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things here. One is uh, leaders, one, need to understand, like, where is that coming from, right? There's always that history that goes with it. So it is a part of the empathy to understand, okay, let me just, one, sit with you and say, all right, what, what, what's going on here? Why do we have this policy? Or why are we afraid to make this change? And really leaning into that piece of it. And then I think it also comes down to experiments. So if you're a leader that you know, wants to try to make change, start small, find one area that has a little glimmer of hope and figure out, okay, can we do something just a tad bit differently here and just learn from it, right? So it really takes that person that has the broad shoulders. It was like, we're just gonna, we're gonna do a little experiment over here. We're maybe gonna take a couple of people who don't normally work together and put them together to see what they can create. And, you know, as you start to gain that momentum and you start to see exactly what's happening, then you can start to make it bigger. But I think organizations these days are going to need change agents, right? Because it's super easy to say, well, we've always done it like that. We're not going to change. And it's really trying to find the leaders that are, are excited and curious and want to be innovative to start to say, hey, let me just spark a little interest here. What do you think? Right. And that's really what it takes. And as you start to see the momentum building and you can start to show we had great success. We did this a little bit differently. We had amazing success. Can we actually experiment larger? Can we scale it out? So it's it's taking risks. It's being a change agent. It's getting creative. And it's also asking your people, what if we worked a different way? What if this policy wasn't here? How would that be? So I think it's, you know, it's it's finding that courage internally to say, okay, I can accept this. And I can let this happen, or I can actually say, no, we're going to start to look at it and make some changes. And that's the hardest part is finding that courage to say, all right, I know I'm in this organization that's been here for a hundred years and we've always done it this way, but we've got to start to find little pockets of glimmers of where we can start to innovate and change. Um, that being said though, and, and this might, people might like kill me after this. I don't like innovation labs. Like I'm not a fan of innovation labs and innovation studios because I feel like and I'm probably going a different direction, that creates almost a silo, right? So it creates like, okay, you get to be the chosen ones that get to go over to the innovation lab or the studio and be on this cool stuff and all you others have to stay out here. So it's really talking about how do we innovate within our current organizational structure 
And then how do we scale it and how do we change it as opposed to creating yeah. these ivory towers of, you know, of in, and, and, you know, I'm not saying that they're bad, but it just becomes like, oh, it's us versus them. And that's what we don't want to create. We want to create organizations where people are excited and they are going to be scared and you are going to, you know, you are going to change how they work and how they operate. But, you know, if we don't, what's the consequence? Like the company may not be, there. I mean, you may not have a job. So there becomes some of these things that you've got to work through to say, okay, how do we start to do just a little bit here, tweak it, find something different. And then we scale it out and we start to really get that momentum. And that, I mean, that's how things are going to, you know, you're going to start to see those changes, but it's tough. I work at a lot of organizations like that. They're like, we've never done it like that. We can't do it. And like, why not? Tell me why not? And it goes back to that policy. that has been in place for 20 years or 30 years. Like, okay, but what if it wasn't there? What would happen? And so it's starting to think about those what if moments. Yeah, that experimentation is so key. Is. And I really like your point about breaking down the silos, mm -hmm. having kind of tiered um, people in your organization, tiered employees, the chosen ones, the special ones, and then everyone else, that's not a healthy culture. So while having an innovation lab in and of itself isn't necessarily a bad thing, depending on how it's implemented, it right. could become a bad thing potentially. And so in the, the bottom line, the main message that I'm hearing you say is, break down the silos, integrate it throughout the culture, throughout the organization. So everyone feels empowered to experiment and to try things and, and then work to empower your change agents. Like it's not hard to see who is kind of influential and who can be a change agent within their team. Um, but there's only so much someone's willing to beat their head against a brick wall. Uh, <laughs> and they before, end up themselves, right? They're like, I'm before they, yeah, <laughs> before they either stop trying, they become disillusioned or they just leave. And right. so you have to identify those people and then find ways to support them and not constantly undermine them over and right. over and over again. Uh, and again, if you do that, people are going to leave. So when I think about the future organization, I'm, I think about a really agile, fast paced, yes. Uh, experimentation culture oriented, you know, kind of organization that's flexible uh, to yeah. meet consumer and internal people needs of the organization. And, and that will allow you to pivot as the marketplace, you know, changes so that you can adapt and you can continue to provide value to the market. And, and if, if you don't do that, who cares if you've done it that way for a hundred years, it, it, it may not translate into the next five years and you're going to find yourself in a world of hurt. And there's so many examples of this. Uh, and, and, you know, we're going to see many more, unfortunately, in the coming years, if people don't start to get more comfortable with adapting. Well, Betsy, it has been a pleasure. I know at the time I'm going to have to know, let you go here in just a minute. I'm like, wow, this is crazy. How fast <laughs> we could go on for hours about all these great topics. But yeah, yeah this has been super fun. And I, you're welcome back anytime we can continue the conversation. But before we close today, I wanted to give you a moment to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Awesome. Yeah. So go to crossimpactcoaching.com. You'll find all about our company and what we do, uh, organization design, leadership coaching, team development, um, subscribe to the newsletter and get some good nuggets. We're starting to publish some really awesome material out there. I'm super excited. Um, you can find me at ted.com, Betsy Kaufman, and four tips for uh, kickstarting honest conversations at work. And that's part of the cultural stuff that we were talking about. And I think um, to summarize this topic, well, one, we're in an amazing, amazing time and organizations are really, really at a great point to start to make some core decisions as to how do they, how do they treat their people? What kind of culture do they have today? And if they don't have it, how do we start to actually focus on that and ensure that we're building great places where people wake up motivated and they end their days fulfilled? I love it. Thanks, Betsy. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Betsy can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe. They can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.